Thank you, Carla. I appreciate that introduction. And, you know, I really just want to thank all the comrades who have already spoken here in this stream. And I also want to thank everyone who's watching who has been in the streets anywhere in the country or quite frankly, anywhere in the world, because I think it's been amazing, um, you know, what we've seen from people around the world. And, and I'm sure uh, anything that's talking about this uprising could be attracting an audience. It's not just in the United States. So welcome to everyone who has been struggling, uh, you know, against or for justice in the case of George Floyd and really to stop the war on Black America, which is what this is representative of. And, and before I go on, I, you know, I'll also just say, you know, this is the Party for Socialism and Liberation live stream. And you know, reflecting on what I just saw before, there's a lot of things I could say, but I think if you want to know what is the PSL, what are we about, and why people who want to fight and struggle for a new and better world uh, should join the PSL, I don't think there could be any better explanation or advertisement than what we've already seen from the comrades of what's going on in every single region and section of this country. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud to, to be affiliated with, with all of these people and the many, many more who are members. I think that what we have seen here in, you know, this past, I mean, it feels almost like months, right? I mean, so much is happening, but really in just about a week and a half in this uprising that has swept the nation is ultimately the power of the people. I mean, whether it be the, the upgrading of charges against this officer, Derek uh, uh, Chauvin, I believe his name is, whether or not the increased new focus on justice for Breonna Taylor's case, uh, you know, the things that we've seen with Ahmed Arbery uh, as well. I mean, so many of these uh, cases themselves, just the momentum and the motion that has taken place from the, the elites of this country since people have been rising up. But I think it even is more deeper than that. I mean, the fact that every single major brand in the country now seems to be trying to find some way to associate itself with the protests. I mean, you know, many of this these things can be considered very cynically, right? Because we know many of these companies don't want to lose customers. Many of the politicians are just worried about losing votes. But at the end of the day, the fact that these curfews can be essentially made a mockery of by a mass movement of people who understood that this movement, there is a, a strong attempt to just derail this movement and who came out and said, okay, this is what you're going to try to make it about something else. Well, we're going to turn the focus back on the real agents of chaos, the police, and turn the focus back into what we know it's been the whole time, uh, which was an amazing moment. And I say all that just to say that, you know, whatever the reasoning People are trying to associate themselves with this uprising, however opportunistic, however self-serving, that in and of itself is a sign that the power of the people in the streets can move the entire political conversation in the country and in the world in the world. I mean, you can see when people are lifting up these protests in the world, they're lifting up people in France, uh, you know, in, in Australia and other places who have been murdered there. I mean, this is really exposing so many of the, the corrupt, rotted out institutions around the world that are brutally repressing people for exactly what they are. And I think that's a powerful, powerful thing for us to remember here is that our own actions are changing the world, changing the conversation, even when the most powerful forces in the world wish that was not happening. And so I just think we should remember that at a time where we're so consistently told that, well, things can only happen via vis-a-vis -vis legal channels or whatever it may be, the correct channels, whatever that is, whatever that even means. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but it certainly means get out of the streets. And I think it really speaks, to, uh, quite frankly, to a deeper truth of, of what we know just from an examination of history is that the biggest change is often made when people use quote unquote, extra legal means. Uh, the sit down strikes and the, and the other labor actions that built the labor movement in this country were primarily illegal when they did them. The legal framework for unions came more or less after, or at least in train with the uprising of workers. The civil rights movement, I mean, people forget this now and right, you know, maybe rightfully so because they didn't succeed, but the civil rights movement was always having to break the law technically, to go against injunctions, uh, you know, all of these segregationist Jim Crow laws, most of it it was technically illegal, at least in the context of those states. But nevertheless, we don't remember those injunctions. We remember the people and what they did and why they did it, because regardless of what the law said, they were on a higher moral plane that, in retrospect, almost everyone, and at least people pay lip service to the facts, uh, that was, was, was beyond these injunctions. So we've seen historically, I mean, uh, the nature 
of these different elements. We've seen that laws oftentimes are pushed forward, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, employment opportunities that for tens of thousands that came in the wake of the Detroit uprising of 1967, that people taking action in the streets that is massively disruptive to the status quo can evoke a response. And we're taught that in school, well, it's all civics. It's all, you know, how a bill becomes law, conjunction, junction. But the real life we've seen in the streets and we've seen it in history. And that's where I think we sit right now at the precipice of a major moment. And I'll, and I'll just note one, just parenthetically as well, it points so heavily to the hypocrisy of the ruling elite in this country that they try, they've tried to derail this movement by you know, dividing the good protester and the bad protester, uh, the peaceful protests from the looting. When this is a country that holds up as one of its great founding myths, the Boston Tea Party, a massive destruction of property, the Minutemen, an uprising of armed people against what they claimed was a tyrannical power at the time. I mean, on and on again, the most sort of violent uprising type uh, uh, allusions are made to the founding fathers to hundreds of years ago, but yet and still people who are standing up for their own rights today are consistently derided for the way it's done. And I think that hypocrisy is also an important element of understanding the nature of where we are right now. But coming, I, I think we've seen so much and we're going to see more. I mean, I think we've heard many people speak already on this live stream about the fact that there are important, large, major events that are going to be happening this very weekend, this very day, tomorrow. I mean, it's happening all the time. I get it. I mean, you know, it's, it's ongoing. It's continuing to push. So we're in a moment where this movement is continuing to grow. And because of the nature of this, this spontaneous uprising that took place coming initially from the Black working class community in, uh, in Minneapolis, rather, and radiating out through the country, uh, we have seen here that uh, the situation has changed a bit. You know, there's two elements to this. One is there's been a massive campaign of disinformation that has come down to try to derail the movement. Now, as Carla mentioned, I was there in Minneapolis. Um, you saw some of the coverage from Breakthrough News, and, and thank you to Juan for mentioning some of that um, as well and the experiences we had there. But, you know, one of the things that was very, very clear was this narrative of quote unquote outside agitators, which, by the way, has been used for ever. I mean, you know, the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King was an outside agitator. People may have seen the things that have been shared around from the 1930s that will be put out by these employers uh, and other Jim Crow types, Negroes beware of communist meeting, outside agitators. Um, I, you know, I don't even know what, how, how this has any provenance anyway. When it comes to war, we're all supposed to be Americans. We're all supposed to be united. But when it comes to protesting against police murder, somehow we're only supposed to protest in our own zip code uh, or that people aren't allowed to show solidarity to people uh, in other places in the country. It's completely and totally absurd. And it rests on some of the most reactionary uh, ideas in this country. And the people who employ the outside agitator thing are usually the people defending the worst elements of the status quo. And you know, Friday night when we were there in Minneapolis, you looked at the mainstream media and, you know, they were having on, you know, civil rights activists and other people, many of whom were speaking eloquently about what was going on, why this uprising was happening. Then the governor, Tim Walls, a Democrat, comes on, you know, his early morning press conference Saturday morning and starts making wild accusations of drug cartels and national conspiracies, literally, he said, the drug cartels might be one, national conspiracies, white supremacists, no evidence, just throwing it all out there that there's some sort of massive manipulation. And of course, the mainstream media then immediately moves to pick that up. Uh, it was the main theme on MSNBC, CNN, going into the weekend of what was going on, that the protests had somehow been hijacked. And you could see on the ground there in Minneapolis, there was zero, zero evidence of this. And certainly our reporting bears that out. Um, you know, we weren't everywhere at all times, but I feel very confident saying that this evidence and fact-free statements from so many public officials were just that. Um, and ultimately, you know, that was an attempt to derail this movement. Now, of course, as I spoke about earlier, that attempt has failed. And I think the attempt to, to, to slow down the movement by making it seem like it's some sort of agent of chaos that's destroying the world or that's manipulated by Russia or something, people clearly are not accepting that. Uh, the vast majority of people who are honest with themselves uh, recognize that this is an indigenous uprising against the reality of 400 years of the oppression of Black people in this country, the accumulated effects of it happening at the confluence of a pandemic disproportionately affecting the Black community and a massive economic crisis that certainly also hits the same working class communities very hard, uh, that that's what's going on. 
So another element has been added into this, and that's the element of, of co-optation. And I think that we are going to see as this movement continues to grow, many people who would love to build a career off of being associated with the mass movement like this. They wouldn't be the first. And, you know, depending on how this turns out, they may not be the last. But at the end of the day, that's something that we've seen over and over and over again when the masses rise up. I think there will be many people who may say, well, see, because people have been, quote unquote, peaceful for the past couple days, uh, that means that, you know, the bad protesters have been moved to the bad, have been moved to the side and the good protesters have taken the, the center stage. Now, that being that as may, many of the people are the same people across all the nights, but that doesn't matter. People will try to use that and use the consciousness and the discipline of people to turn the political message back against the Trumps of the world, many of the Democratic politicians of the world that were trying to redirect the focus. They're going to take that disciplined, conscious approach of people and try to turn that into some another way to divide the movement, to demonize certain people. But I think the most important thing about all of these things for everyone who's watching is that this is nothing new. Every movement that's ever succeeded has had dif disinformation campaigns waged against it, has had state governmental forces try to disrupt it, have had people who don't have the interests of the movement in heart try to hijack it. So I don't think that in and of itself is something to be afraid of. Revolutions and rebellions are messy. They don't always happen the way you want them to happen. They don't always happen when you expect them to happen. The issues you think are going to be the main issue isn't always the main issue. It's dynamic. There's millions of people in motion. How can millions of people go into motion in spontaneous righteous outrage and it not be a little jumbled initially? That's the nature of a growing movement trying to find its footing and get its legs underneath it as it starts to push its fight back. And I think that is the moment that we're really entering now, a movement that's really getting its legs underneath it, as it will, and starting to stand up, move quicker and, and get a footing for, for the, the, the nature of this struggle as a long term struggle beyond independent or individual moments. And then, you know, this has been said many times in many places. It's not a mov moment, it's a movement. And that's certainly how it feels here now. So, you know, I want to conclude by just speaking to, you know, maybe what's most relevant here. And that's the what next, if, if we're saying this is a rising movement that has, you know, some ways to push, but certainly is, is, is very hopeful in what it has emerged and, and on earth. I think it's important to recognize a few things when we think about what's next. And, you know, my principal piece and what I want to explain here is, is what's really next is we need to get organized. I mean, it sounds pat, but really the most important part of any mass social movement that has achieved victory, uh, even in a partial sense, is the consistency of principled organization that emerges from the base of the communities and, and classes that are struggling themselves. You know, Dr. King, in his final book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community?, he speaks a little bit to this issue of the good protester, bad protester thing when he's talking about the impact of the Watts uprising and other uprisings on the so-called backlash. And the 1966 midterm elections was called the so-called backlash election. And people were saying, well, conservative forces did very well because there was an uprising in Watts and also black people started screaming black power. And basically it scared white people in the suburbs and it started to ruin everything that was great about the civil rights movement. And Dr. King says, that he doesn't agree with that at all. And in fact, he doesn't actually believe, he did not actually believe that it was Watts or, or the call for black power that really led to the backlash. And he points out that the, real, the roots of the backlash were already there. And that the backlash was a response to the fact that the movement for black freedom, for black liberation had reached a stage in which its demands were going into the true underlying class nature of the status quo of the United States of America. It was shaking the foundation of people's comfort and privilege in many different ways, uh, sometimes in ways that were legitimately threatening to them, sometimes in ways that weren't, but they just thought they were because that's what they were taught. And that the backlash was representative of the cleavage between what the status quo was willing to permit and what needed to really happen for thoroughgoing transformative change to actually take place. And I think that's an important point because it speaks to the moment that we're in right now because people will say, well, you know, we don't want to derail the movement and so much of what happened was about something else. But so much of the discomfort that we're seeing from elites isn't because people are burning stores. It isn't because they're breaking windows. It isn't because they're stealing stuff from Target. It's because the explosion of this uprising at the confluence of these three 
major crises, the ongoing continued brutal war against Black America, the pandemic, as well as the massive economic crisis, are creating a situation where they may lose control, where people are really starting to question, okay, these people are allegedly in power, but they seem to have zero answers for the problems that are facing us. And in fact, oftentimes, seem to be directly arrayed with the forces that are creating the problems. And in that context, you know, this is a movement that must be repressed and must be derailed. And thus there is any type of attempt to, uh, you know, make it can be considered illegitimate. To return to where this movement started, the black working class community of Minneapolis rising up righteously and uh, igniting the community of Minneapolis. Look, I was there. There was a tremendous amount of solidarity across the whole community of Minneapolis and the breadth of the sort of demographic differences in that city for, you know, the, the black liberation movement writ large is the best way I think I could describe it. Um, certainly the movement for justice for George Floyd, but it was clear that people understood it was more than that. And that, you know, this was indicative. Um, his assassination was indicative of the assassination of so many. And, you know, when you look at that and you think about what are our tasks now, in my view, it's in a way to steal a page from the labor movement to organize the unorganized. I think when we look at uprisings and rebellions, and I talked about in the past, uh, you know, and in our history, how we've seen uprisings and rebellions can be catalysts for the legislative process to move and the economic process to move and sometimes move quickly to try to meet people's needs. And I think the reality of that is because oftentimes the rebellions, and, and again, to quote from Dr. King, you know, it's the, lang it, it's the language of the unheard. And it's people who, I think, I mean, you look at political legitimacy in this country, every president in this country usually only has between about 25 and 32% of all voting age adults that voted for them. You know, you look at the black community in any given election, between 40 and 70% of people aren't voting. We know people who don't vote are overwhelmingly working class, younger people of color. There is a huge majority of people who understand the system is so bankrupt, but who have been marginalized, who have been beat down, who have been exploited, who have been oppressed, and their voices are not heard. Sometimes they're physically excluded, like those of ex-felons in many states, former felons, if that's what you want to call them, and whatever, uh, you know, human beings who have had their rights taken away because they were once in jail. Um, you know, I, I think we can see that factor. But we also know that these, these uprisings are when they enter the political process. They've been maybe untouched by some of the things we're told that we have to uh, abide by, the civics class stuff, the legislative process, the existing major political parties. But they exist and they have a voice and this is their voice. But the most important thing is to give that voice not just a periodic expression, but an ongoing platform and an ongoing way to fight back consistently and in a way that is commensurate with what we are facing. And that is ultimately what the PSL is. We're a socialist party. We're a revolutionary working class party. We want to bring together the multinational working class and all its variega uh, uh, variegated realities and allow people to speak their own truth, their own anger, bitterness, frustration, and desire for systematic change, unmediated by any of this nonsense about the legitimacy of the system and, and all of that. I mean, that's really who we are. That's what we want to do. That's the base of what we want to organize and how we want to, and, and, and how we want to present to the world. Because, you know, to go up against the most powerful politicians, the biggest corporations, all the people who, no matter what they say, basically don't want the status quo to change. The voices have to be organized. They have to be collective. The conversations between one another and the hundreds of thousands to develop a program and present it to the world in a way that can call in millions and really confront and change this system can only happen through tight centralized democratic organization. And that's what we are calling on people to join. That's what we are calling on people to help us build. We aren't just having this live stream so we can sit here and say we have all the answers and we know everything, but that we are working class people who have banded together to try to fight back and to try to not just fight back and be 50 years talking about how we still do need to do something about police brutality, but how to win. And we want you to join us because we need you to win. And the ultimate reality is, is that means we need to be in the streets. And I'm proud to say in some cities, the PSL is going to be leading and already is leading. And in every city and in every state, we're out there and we're a part of it. And we need to continue to be there and let people know who we are and to fly our flag and to let people know who are coming out into the streets who feel completely unheard by the total of the political system. They're right. 
The political system doesn't care about them. They have cast you away. You are marginalized, but there is a way that you can stand up and fight back and be counted and be a part of a movement that isn't just trying to make change but for, for the sake of change, but make change for the sake of finally improving our lives in a way that is substantive and transformative. So that's the moment that we sit in right now, I think. Um, again, I want to appreciate everyone who is watching this live stream who you know, has been out in the streets, who has been fighting. Um, I just salute you. And thanks again to everyone here who spoke on um, you know, the live stream previous to me. I really appreciated it and quite frankly learned a lot about what's going on around the movement. So thank you.